War in Europe. Conflict of a scale that has not been seen upon the European continent since World War II. It's happening, ladies and gentlemen. Over 70 years of relative peace has been shattered just last week. Who would have thought that we would look on, that the world would look on, whilst one nation butchered another in broad daylight? But you know what's happening? It's happening as we speak. Russian troops are still on the march. Hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced. Ukraine is under attack from Russia. And friends, we would like to welcome you to this Christadelphian Bible-based presentation this evening. This evening we'd like to take a look at what is happening in the current Russian-Ukraine crisis. We'll seek to understand a little bit about the background of what is happening there, and then we're going to take a look at these events through the perspective of the Bible. But at the outset, we do want to just mention that we are not political supporters of Russia or of Ukraine, and we have no political affiliations. We are simply here to discuss the amazing insights that the Bible brings to today's world events. So what is happening? Well, late last year, reports began emerging of an increased military presence on the Russian border of Ukraine. The country of Ukraine, as you can see from the map on the screen, is sandwiched between Russia and Eastern Europe. In November last year, satellite imagery was published showing that up to 100,000 Russian troops had assembled along the Ukrainian border. And when asked for a reason for such an escalation of military presence, Russia denied that it was preparing for an invasion and instead accused the US and European alliance of NATO of increasing its own military activity in the region. Again, this map here from the BBC shows that there were some 16,000 or so NATO troops that were deployed in Eastern Europe at the time. And Putin assured the world, as he gathered 100,000 of his own, that it was, this was simply in response to the military threat presented by NATO. Well, in December of last year, Russia then demanded that Ukraine never join NATO, a request that NATO denied. And so on the 17th of January this year, Russian troops began arriving in Belarus, just north of Ukraine, for what they termed joint military exercises. About a month later, Russia stated that some of its troops had been withdrawn from the areas near the Ukrainian border. However, NATO denied that that was the case and said they'd seen no evidence of such withdrawal. One week later, February the 22nd, Putin recognised the independence of two Russian-backed separatist regions on eastern Ukraine. He immediately declared that troops would be sent in to support these regions with their independence. And from that point on, the maps and the photos tell the story. On the 24th of February, war began. Putin announced a special military operation by Russian troops it was underway in Ukraine. Ukraine called it a full-scale Russian invasion. Russians advanced from three sides, including from the north, from Belarus. Over 100 missiles and 75 Russian bombers attacked, targeting Ukraine's air defences, supply depots and their airfields. Explosions were felt and heard across the country. They failed to cripple the armed forces and some of Ukrainian's air force did manage to remain operational. However, by day two, the territorial gains were significant, represented here in red. Already, 
Russia had taken control of the nuclear site Chernobyl and it was already on the doorstep of Ukraine's capital city, Kiev. The breakaway territories of Luhansk and Donetsk are by now considered occupied, as, it's land, as is the land immediately north of Crimea. On day three, Saturday the 26th of February, land gains remain largely unchanged. And so Western allies assert that Russia is facing logistical issues and an unexpectedly strong Ukrainian resistance. A couple of days later, on Monday the 28th of February, a long convoy of trucks is first noted heading for, for Kiev from the north. Further details of this convoy emerge over the next few days, showing the column to be some 64 kilometres in length. However, the column appears to have come to a stall over the last few days once again giving Western leaders hope that Ukraine is successfully resisting. But slow though it may be, over the last few days, a gradual encroachment upon the capital and other major cities has continued. And President Emmanuel Macron of France, after receiving a call from Vladimir Putin, warned that the, re the worst is yet to come. Meanwhile, Putin assured the world that the military operation is going ahead as planned. Reports are emerging from Ukraine of thousands upon thousands of Ukrainians in a desperate plight. Hundreds, if not thousands, have been innocently, of innocent people have been killed. More than one million Ukrainians have left their homes and fled the country. Millions of people are trapped. They can't get out due to lack of infrastructure. They can't get food due to lack of Russian cooperation. And perhaps, and understandably so, this leaves us feeling upset. Heartbroken for the families who have lost a dad. Fearful for those who are trapped and who cannot get to safety. In disbelief that someone could do such a thing in the middle of the 21st century and maybe even concerned that the war might spread. Certainly, people are asking, are we headed for world war? And if not this year, well, what about next? You see, the world doesn't seem to be getting a safer place. And so if it's the question, where exactly are we all headed? Well, to a large extent, the answers to these questions rest with one man, at least in the immediate future. As the world looks on, seemingly helpless, the question on everyone's lips is, how far will Putin go? Political analysts around the world have been offering all sorts of suggestions. Some say that Putin has been caught off guard and that he's struggling with his military offensive. Others warn of what might happen if Putin feels that he's been backed into a corner and threatened. A number of American generals have suggested that this is not the type of war that Russia and Vladimir Putin can win. Well, when we turn to the president of Ukraine, he sends out a rather different message. It's courageous on the one hand, yet desperate on the other. Whilst he's de determined to win, President Zelensky warned Europe that if Putin, that, sorry, that Putin will not stop with Ukraine. If we fall, you will fall, said Zelensky. But when we ask the historians, they have another, hist they have a, another story sorry, to tell. You see, when Vladimir Putin was born on October the 7th, 1952, he entered a very different Russia than the one that exists today. World War II had recently rocked Europe, and in the wake of the Second World War, two alliances had sprung up or strengthened themselves. In the East, Putin's homeland, Russia and a number of neighboring countries tightened relations 
in what they termed the Soviet Union. Essentially, a Russian-led alliance of nations in Eastern Europe. In the West, America had united with a number of European nations to form what they called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, designed to counter any security threats from the East. And so you can see that Europe was essentially split down the middle. In fact, a name was coined to describe this split. It was called the Iron Curtain. Europe was divided in two. Over time, the Soviet Union began to disintegrate because of internal division and systemic inefficiencies. Oppression and corruption were rife. And slowly but surely, the satellite states, these countries out on east, the eastern side of Europe, they looked across the divide and saw the prosperity and the freedom of their western counterparts. And so, one by one, countries left the Soviet Union. Until finally, little more than Russia was left. And the Union officially disbanded in 1991. Putin was 39 years old when this event occurred, and he would never forget it. Putin has been known to lament the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. That is, over and above both world wars. But what does Putin mean? Well, he means that he wants Russia back in power. Not just in power, Putin wants Russia to be a world power, a superpower like it once was. But he wants more than that. Just take a look at this interview held in December last year, only three months ago. Reuters news outlet reports that President Vladimir Putin has lamented the collapse of the Soviet Union three decades ago as the demise of what he called historical Russia. Putin's comments released, sorry, released on the Russian state TV on Sunday are likely to further fuel speculation about his foreign policy intentions among critics. Critics who accuse him of planning to recreate the Soviet Union and of contemplating an attack on Ukraine, a notion that the Kremlin has dismissed as fear-mongering. That was three months ago. It was a disintegration of historical Russia under the name of the Soviet Union, Putin said, of the 1991 breakup. We turned into a completely different country, he continues. And what had been built up over 1,000 years was largely lost. He then said that 25 million Russian people in newly independent countries suddenly found themselves cut off from Russia, part of what he called a major humanitarian tragedy. So can you see what Putin's saying here? He's saying that all of those countries of Eastern Europe, they weren't just satellite states of the Soviet Union, they were Russia. And Putin wants Russia back. He wants it back as an empire. And as part of that empire, he wants Ukraine. But however far Putin may or may not plan to go, he has been clear about his toleration of interference. In launching his invasion on the 24th of February, Putin said, whoever tries to stop us should know that Russia's response will be immediate. And it will lead to such consequences that you have never faced in your history. And lest the world should misunderstand him, shortly thereafter, Putin placed Russia's nuclear forces on high alert. Well, what a state the world is in. People are worried. They are really worried. Not necessarily that there's imminent nuclear war, but that the threat of it makes countering or controlling Putin an awfully difficult task. Sanctions have been tried, 
But as the Ukrainian president rightly observed, the commitment of the US and other countries to only offer sanctions rather than troops is essentially the green light that Putin needs in order to launch his invasion. So where is it all going to lead? And more importantly, where is it going to end? Well, at this point, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that there is an ancient prophecy in the Bible that speaks of the rise of Russia in exactly the way that we have been seeing. And it predicted it thousands of years ago. Now, you may be surprised to hear that the Bible, this Bible prophecy necessitates that Russia control Ukraine. In fact, many world events that we've been seeing in just the last five years fit in perfectly with this Bible prophecy, as we'll see shortly. And perhaps the bit you've been waiting for, this Bible prophecy tells us precisely how far Russia will go in the long run and how Russia's objectives are going to end. So if you've got a Bible with you, please turn with me to the Old Testament to the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel contains one of many Bible prophecies about Armageddon, but this one is most detailed. Now, in discussing the, the topic of Armageddon, it is important to understand that in the Bible, Armageddon simply refer, uh, refers to the world war which will occur just before Jesus Christ returns from heaven. Armageddon is not some conspiracy theory of the destruction of the entire globe as is commonly portrayed in movies around the world today. <clears throat> well, Ezekiel was a prophet of God who was sent to the nation of Israel. He lived around 2,600 years ago, in about 600 BC. This man, Ezekiel, was given many visions, with some of his early visions recording the decimation of the nation of Israel. And here on the screen we have a summary of the closing visions of the book of Ezekiel. In chapter 37, he was shown a vision of the bringing back of the nation of Israel to their homeland after centuries of being dispersed across the whole world. Chapter 38 then records the final battle of the nations after Israel is back in their land. Chapter 39 then shows the way in which the invader of Israel will be defeated by Jesus Christ. And then chapters 40 through to the end of Ezekiel describe the time of peace and security that will follow when God sets up his son, Jesus Christ, as king of the whole world from Jerusalem. So let's now take a look at what was seen or told to Ezekiel by God here in Ezekiel chapter 38. The battle the battleground of Ezekiel 38 is at the heart of three of the Earth's continents, the meeting point of Europe, Asia and Africa. Ezekiel 38 begins with a call to a powerful Russian leader to amass an army and to mount an invasion down to the south. The man we are introduced to is a formidable dictator. He originates from the land of Russia, he will lead up a vast confederacy of nations, including France, Italy and Germany over in Western Europe, Ukraine and the Eastern European states, Turkey and Iran, as well as Ethiopia, Libya and much of the North African continent. We are informed that he will mount an invasion south from Russia into Ezekiel's homeland, the land of Israel. The Russian Confederacy will sweep south through the land, conquering Israel and continuing on into Egypt. Ezekiel is told the invading army will be like a ferocious, unstoppable storm. Saudi Arabia, to the southeast of Israel, backed by Britain and her allies, will confront the Russian forces and ask them what they think they are doing here in Israel. The Russian conqueror, Ezekiel tells us, will be in search of economic treasure. 
he'll loot the conquered lands and he'll carry the stolen goods back up to his northern homeland in Russia. But there's more to this invasion. It's not simply a money rampage. This is a religious war. This is a clash of deep-rooted ideologies, belief systems with centuries of hostility between them. This is the invasion of a man who is deeply religious, heading up an army bound together by a common objective, and that is to take the holy mountain, Jerusalem. This story is the conquest of the age-old city, Jerusalem. The city coveted by three of the world's religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But before we look at the, the details of the prophecy itself, you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, this is, this is all very well. You Christophians look at the news, you find some old Bible story to match it, twist a few things, you make it fit, and you say, see, Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. But that is certainly not the case. This is no new interpretation that we are sharing with you tonight. You see, Bible students for years have been saying that Russia and her allies will invade Israel just before Jesus Christ returns. And I'll give you just one example of this. This book, Elpis Israel, was written 170 years ago by a man named John Thomas. And in the preface to this work, he writes, the future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times because they are predicted in the scriptures of truth. When Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things, as at present constituted, is at hand. So here's just one Christadelphian, and many more would follow, who believe that Russia will invade the land of Israel in accordance with the prophecies of Ezekiel 38. And just one other thing before we launch into the story as portrayed in Ezekiel. It is important to understand that when we're reading this chapter, we're reading a, a prophecy that was given originally in Hebrew and that is extraordinarily old. This means that if we're to work out the different identities and territories that are being spoken of, we're going to need to go both to scholars of the Hebrew language as well as scholars of ancient history in order to understand. Now, it's going to take us about 20 minutes or so to crack this prophecy. But please stay with us, because once we've worked out who the different players are, we'll then be able to bring it all together and see what happens in this coming world war. So let's begin by reading the first three verses of Ezekiel 38. And I've put it on the screen there for you from the New King James Version. Now the word of the Lord came to me, that is, came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Goma and all his troops, the house of Tagama from the far north, and all its troops. Many people are with you. So here we have this prophecy of Ezekiel, or to Ezekiel, of this man called Gog, who rules over these places called Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and he heads up an army, including many other nations. And he uses all these ancient names, which, of course, are mostly unknown today. So what does it all mean? Well, in verse 2... Ezekiel was introduced to the supreme commander of this confederacy. Now, how might Ezekiel, 2,600 years ago, describe the leader of this army in such a way that we could still understand him today? Well, he calls him the one at the top. 
That's the meaning of the Hebrew word Gog. This man Gog is at the top of this military confederacy. But Gog is not his name, it's his title or description. So it's almost like Ezekiel is saying or calling him the captain or the commander. So what then do we know about this, this captain, this one at the top? Well, firstly, as we go through the prophecy, you'll notice that God keeps speaking to Gog throughout. So, for example, in verse 3, he says, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog. And as we go, we'll find that the whole way through, God keeps speaking to this man. But if we were to jump down halfway through the prophecy to verses 14 to 16, which I'll just put here on the screen for you as well, we get a very neat summary of what this man Gog is going to do. Son of man, this is God speaking to Ezekiel again. Son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus saith the Lord God, you will come from your place out of the far north. So notice that. Gog lives north of Israel. You and many people with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. So there's a few things to note here. Firstly, Gog lives to the far north of Israel, which was, of course, Ezekiel's homeland. Secondly, Gog will lead an immense military confederacy. You saw many people with you, horses and chariots. Thirdly, he will invade the land of Israel. And finally, all of this is going to occur in what God terms the latter days. Now, the latter days is a phrase used by God throughout the Bible to describe events which will occur in the era just before Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And here it refers to our times. And so in verse 14 to 16 there, you can see God says that Gog would come against Israel in the latter days and also in verse 8. This would occur in the latter days, we're told. So this prophecy given to Ezekiel is not yet fulfilled. Okay, so we know that it's an end time prophecy and we know that this, this predicts an autocrat will sweep down and invade the land of Israel. So now we just need to know who's in his army. Well, if we go back to verse 2, we read, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. So we know that this man Gog is from the land of Magog. We also know that he's called the Prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal at the end of the verse. So let's try and understand what these places are. Well, beginning with Magog, we find that Magog is the ancient name for the modern territory of southwestern Russia, including the Ukraine and Eastern European territories. Now we know that because the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in the first century AD, gives us a most helpful start by identifying the place where Gog originates from. He says... Magog founded those that were called the Magogites, but who by the Greeks were called Scythians. Now, that's very helpful because the boundaries of Scythia are well known. In the time of Herodotus, which was about 400 BC, so close to Ezekiel's time, the Scythians were distributed across southern Russia. In fact, Herodotus, who lived 400 BC, even tells us that the western boundary of this area of Scythia was the river Don in Europe, and the eastern boundary was, sorry, the eastern boundary was the river Don, and the western boundary was the Danube in Europe. So the land of Magog in Ezekiel 38 and verse 2 is southwestern Russia and eastern Europe. So if we were to then place that on the screen, we can use the, the rivers mentioned by the historian Herodotus to lay out the territory of Magog. So that's where Gog comes from, Eastern Europe and southwestern Russia. 
We also know that he's prince of three other places, Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. So where are they? Well, again, we go to the textbooks. And in commenting on the Hebrew word Rosh, the Hebrew scholar Jesenius says that they are undoubtedly the Russians, who he says were also known as the Ross. Two scholars of Russian history confirm this link between Rosh or Ross and modern Russia. There's the Russian-American historian, George Vernatsky, who writes, the name Ras, or Ross, in South Russia, existed there from at least the fourth century. And we also know that the, the river Volga, the main river in Russia, used to be called the Ross. So now we can add Rosh to our map. That is, of course, the territory of modern-day Russia, according to the historians. Well, next there was those territories of Meshach and Tubal. Meshach, we find, from this quotation from a Bible encyclopedia by McClintock and Strong, Meshach was essentially always mentioned together with Tubal, and these two tribes inherited, inhabited sorry, the territory known as the Moschian Mountains between the Black and Caspian Seas. So we can head straight back to our map. We can find the Black Sea here and the Caspian Sea here, and we can conclude that Meshach and Tubal overlap with this area of Rosh. So now we know that this person titled Gog will be the leader of Russia at the time of this war. Well, the next few names are a little more simple. The names mentioned in verse 5 of Ezekiel 38 are still commonly used today. We have Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. Persia is modern day, the, the modern-day country of Iran, and you can just type it into Wikipedia, which tells us that Iran was commonly known until the mid-20th century as Persia in the Western world. Here in Ezekiel 38, it includes the territory of Iran, but it also extends further east to include Turkestan and Afghanistan. We also have Ethiopia and Libya mentioned in verse 5. Again, they are fairly intuitive. Ancient Ethiopia included Ethiopia as it is today, but also the territory of Sudan, bordering Egypt. And Libya referred to Libya and the countries out along the west of the, north, the northern coast of the African continent. So heading back to our map, to make that make sense, we've got Persia, including Iran, Afghanistan over here, and then we have Libya and Ethiopia down on the north of the African continent. Well, finally, we reach the last two parties in this confederacy in verse 6. There is Goma and all his troops and the house of Tagama and all their, I think, all their troops, the house of Tagama anyway. Well, Goma is identified by the historian Josephus when he says that this was a tribe who settled in the area of Gaul. Encyclopedia Britannica then informs us that Gaul is the region inhabited by the ancient Gauls, of course, comprising modern-day France, parts of Belgium, Western Germany, and Northern Italy. So when we place Goma on the map, if Magog is Eastern Europe, then Goma is Western Europe. And finally, we come to the last of Russia's allies, which is Tagama. Tagama is identified by the scholar Jesenius as a northern nation which originated from the tribe of Goma, but which travelled down to the area of Armenia, just north of Turkey. He continues that the Armenians themselves regard Togum, the son of Goma, as the founder of their nation, and they call themselves the House of Togom. Other historians inform us that Armenians, the Armenians spread throughout much of Turkey. And as a result, the Jews say that by Tagama, or the house of Tagama, we are to understand the Turks. So to head back to our map, we find that Tagama extends through Turkey and, and really up into this area of Armenia and the Caucasus Mountains there. So now you can see on the map in front of you 
This is the Russian-led military alliance described by the prophet Ezekiel 2,600 years ago. Now that is a powerful force and it converges here at the centre of three continents. So now let's see who this army is invading. In verse 8 we read, In the latter years thou, that is Gog, the invader, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. So Russia is going to invade the land of Israel. But notice that Israel is described as the land brought back from the sword. Well, why is that? Here on the screen is a painting of what happened about 2,000 years ago to the land of Israel. In the year AD 70, they were invaded by the Romans, who spread the Jews all through the then known world in what came to be known as the Diaspora. The Jews remained spread across the entire world until 74 years ago, in the year 1948, when the nation of Israel was reformed as a result of World War II. Newspapers all over the world captured the event, such as this famous example from the Palestine Post, as it announced, the state of Israel is born. And this is the nation that Russia here is going to come down and invade. And verses 10 through to 12 of Ezekiel 38 tell us that the motive, tell us about the motive of this Russian commander, Gog. He sweeps south because he wants plunder. He wants money. And it may be that he is going to find great economic treasure in the gas and the oil fields off the western coast of Israel. But why does it have to be Israel? Why is this world war going to be surrounding this little tiny nation of Israel? I mean, surely some Russia could go somewhere else if they wanted to get rich. Well, it's true that Russia wants money, but she also wants power. She wants geolit- uh, geopolitical power. That's why you don't use big words. She wants geopolitical power. And so it just happens that this nation of Israel lies at the centre of three of the Earth's continents. And that makes it a very desirable land bridge if you want to dominate the region. But there's even more to it than that. We learn from other prophecies in the Old Testament that this is a war of religion. Russia and Europe share Christianity as their age-old religion. And whilst it's true that they had a dispute about a thousand years ago, which, which resulted in a big rift between the Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church, those ties are now mending. And another Old Testament prophet, the prophet Joel, writes about this same war, Armageddon. He says that God will gather all nations to war to Jerusalem. But then look at what he says in Joel 3 and verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations, he says. Prepare for a holy war. This is a religious war. Gog is not not motivated simply by greed and pride. He is also deeply entrenched in religious traditions. And that is why he definitely wants Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the religious capital of the world. Just think about it. It was at Jerusalem that Judaism found its age-old centre. It was Jerusalem that Jesus Christ lived in, died in, and from where he ascended to heaven. And it is from Jerusalem that the Islamic people say that the prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. And those three religious groups account for well over half of the world's population. Russia wants Jerusalem. You want to know how important religion is to President Putin? Well, on the 15th of June in the year 2020, just a couple of years ago, Putin's Russia completed a grand new church. He called it the main cathedral of the armed forces. Now, how's that for a link between church and state? 
This cathedral was built in honour of the armed forces. But what's fascinating about the event is what the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church said at, it, at its opening ceremony. Patriarch Kirill said, with this harmony between the might of the armed forces and the spiritual might of the church, of church and state, let the path of our people go on into the future in peace and prosperity. And notice this bit, the next bit. And of this path, God willing, let there be new victories, new achievements, and no defeats. Now, why does a peace-loving religious leader say that? I wonder what victories Patriarch Kirill was referring to in his speech two years ago. You see, in Russia, church and state go hand in glove. This is fascinating. Putin himself is deeply religious. Russia is religious. And so are her, are her allies. And so, as Bible prophecy predicts, she wants to take Jerusalem. But when we now come back to the story here in Ezekiel 38, when Go comes down to invade the land of Israel, he and his army are going to be met by an opposing force, a different group of nations who come up from the south. And so in verse 13, we read, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Notice here the type of opposition that Russia receives. This is verbal opposition. And it's all about money. Might even remind you of some of the Western rhetoric that we've seen just this last week. This is how these powers work. But who are the opposing forces? Well, we've got Sheba and Eden, the merchants or traders of Tarshish, and the young lions. So again, we go back to the history books to work out who they are. We find that Sheba and Eden occupied the territory of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and the other Gulf states, pictured there on the, the small map on the top of the screen. After reviewing the, the literature, one student states, Sheba and Eden point to the inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula. And again, we've got a couple of citations from the Hebrew scholar Jesenius to back that up. So we have Saudi Arabia and her neighbours. Next, I mentioned the merchants of Tarshish. Well, Tarshish is actually mentioned many times throughout the Bible. And when we bring together the different clues from, from the Bible, we can form quite a comprehensive picture of who she is. We know, for example, that Tarshish is called an island power in the Bible. We know that she was renowned for her navy in Bible times, and she is west of the land of Israel. She's known for her trading as a merchant. And already, you, you might already be noticing that this description fits the nation of Britain very well. Britain's an island power. The British Empire is said to have ruled the waves as our explorers went out and discovered the US, Australia and other places. You can see from the little map there on the, the top of the screen that Britain is to the far west from the land of Israel. She has long been renowned as a merchant power. And you'll notice in particular that Britain, or in the Bible Tarshish, was renowned as a source of tin. In fact, a study performed only uh, three years ago in 2019 found that tin ingots discovered in Israel were actually mined in Cornwall, England. They sort of broke them down and, and studied the tin and they found that that tin had come from Cornwall. So we know that there was a trading link between Israel and Britain. And what's more, we know that Tarshish traded tin. I guess that doesn't really make sense until you, unless you appreciate that tin was actually a very rare commodity in um, ancient times. So the fact that Cornwall traded tin is a standout feature. Well, there were two more descriptions of Tarshish in the Bible as well. 
They're associated with the young lions and they share an alliance with Israel. So what are these young lions all about in Ezekiel 38 and verse 13? Well, Britain has long been known, or depicted as, the mother lion, and the Commonwealth countries as her young lions. Here on the screen is a couple of posters taken from World War I, in which Britain, portrayed as the mother lion, roars to the Commonwealth nations to come to its aid. But is this simply a, a feature of the past? Well, no, not at all. You will find the British lion on the coat of arms for Australia, on the coat of arms for Canada, and even on the coat of arms for the city of Adelaide. You can actually just type in Wikipedia an explanation of the coat of arms of Adelaide and it will tell you that the lion represents the English origins of the settlers who first established South Australia. In fact, if you own an Australian passport, then you are a citizen of one of the young lions. So the young lions of Ezekiel 38 and verse 13 represent the Commonwealth nations. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, as well as America who came from Britain. And just like they did in World War I and II, these countries will respond to the call of the mother lion and join Britain and Saudi Arabia in their opposition to Gog, the chief commander of the Russian superpower. Okay, so let's bring all of that together on a map then. Egypt and Jordan were going to, to place there in grey, simply because they're mentioned in other Bible prophecies, but not so much here. Sheba and Deden are going to be aligned with Britain, seen there in blue, and Israel will place at the centre in yellow. When Russia comes down to invade Israel from the north, Saudi Arabia, backed by Britain and her allies, are going to oppose this invasion. So that's what we see in Ezekiel chapter 38. The Russian conqueror invades the land of Israel. And this, friends, is what we call, or what the Bible calls, the Battle of Armageddon. Russia and her allies will inflict extreme, extremely heavy losses upon the land of Israel. Other Bible prophecies inform us that two-thirds of the Jewish nation are going to die. But thankfully, that isn't where it ends. Ezekiel chapter 38 continues in verse 18. It will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, and all men who are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. So there's going to be this earthquake, worse than any earthquake that we've seen before. And God is going to destroy Gog. And just look here how he does it. He says, every man's sword will be against his brother. I'll bring into judgment I'll bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down upon him and on his troops and on the many people who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. So God's going to use all sorts of strategies to conquer Go. He'll cause confusion within the Russian ranks. He'll cause disease. I mean, we've just seen how the, the, re the havoc that, that COVID wreaked. He's going to use disease to bring the Russian forces to its knees. And he will use the forces of nature against Russia. And so God will conquer Gog and his empire. And other Bible prophecies inform us that this is the time that Jesus Christ will have returned to the earth from heaven. And shortly after Russia's fall, he will set up the kingdom of God centred in Jerusalem. And that, friends, is the part of the story that we look forward to. That's the reason that we find current world events exciting, albeit terribly sad. There is a far better day to come, and the events that we're seeing in the world around us herald 
that day. Well, speaking of the events that we're seeing, just take a look at how many things have occurred in the last few years, each one another step towards the fulfilment of this prophecy. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. In 2014, she annexed Crimea. Today, in 2022, Russia is invading Ukraine. And people have asked how far the Ukrainian com conflict will go. Will it stop with Ukraine? Will it go further? Well, the answer is that we can't be sure at this point in time. Perhaps it won't be surprising if, once it's achieved its aim, Russia regroups, goes back home, and prepares for the next instalment. We've seen this wave-like pattern as Putin bites off little bits of his neighbours one by one. And that brings us to the next question. Who's the Russian Gog? Is it Vladimir Putin? Well, again, the answer is that we can't say for sure. Putin certainly bears all the hallmarks of Gog. He's deceitful. He's cunning. He's ambitious. He's deeply religious. And he is relentlessly committed. But if Putin is Gog, then, as one analyst writes, he's running out of time. Putin is now 69 years old. He's got 10 years, say, and he wants to make his mark on world history. And Ukraine is learning the style that he uses to do that, and it's not pretty. This man is pre prepared to threaten the world with nuclear arms in order to achieve his goals. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we've only really seen the beginning of Putin's plans. Well, speaking of Putin, what else has he been up to? Here is a meeting with the head of Iran that Putin held only a month before he commenced his invasion into Ukraine. Putin is trying to strengthen ties with Persia. Only the other day, Turkey stressed how important it is that they don't offend Russia. Tagama wants to be at one with Russia. You may be aware that Putin's Russia came to the rescue in cleaning up ISIS alongside the US. But just take a look on that map at how many military bases Russia left behind. In fact, Russia has military bases only a few kilometres northeast of Israel's border. And then there's Libya. This article, published in June 2022, sorry, June 2020, states that Russia wants a foothold in Libya, including military bases. You may notice, however, that currently Putin is at odds with the rest of Europe, with those areas of, of Goma and Mago. And so we would expect one of two things. Either Putin will repair relations with Europe and become confederate with them, or he will conquer them too. In fact, the NATO alliance that we spoke of earlier is either going to have to change, break up, or be rendered powerless. Now, why is that? Simply because it currently includes Canada, America, and the UK, all of whom are going to oppose Russia in the future. Now, you might sit there thinking, like, seriously, when's that going to happen? But just remember, it wasn't so long ago that Britain was tied with Europe as part of the European Union. But as you can see from this, this map here on the screen, Britain and Europe are on opposing sides in Ezekiel 38. So something had to change. And in fact, Christadelphian writers, based upon their careful reading of Ezekiel 38, stated that in the events depicted here in Ezekiel 38, at the time of the end, Britain may well leave or be forced to leave the EU. That was a Christadelphian by the name of John Alfrey back in 1999. 16 years later, the process commenced of Britain's departure from the European Union. 
that is in, is in perfect harmony, friends, with what we would expect from Ezekiel chapter 38. Not only that, but look at the alliances forming between Britain and her allies. Since she left the European Union, Britain has been consolidating trade alliances around the world, including this free trade agreement that it's formed, forming with Australia. There's also talk of the UK forming a new superpower with Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the US, the young lines of Ezekiel 38. Then there's Israel herself and her neighbours, such as those on the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Now these Arabian tribes have long been enemies of Israel. They've tried for decades to wipe Israel from the map. Less than two years ago, in 2020, you may recall the peace agreements that were brokered by the US between Israel and some of her Arab partners. These were termed the Abraham Accords, with one between Israel and the UAE pictured here on the screen, and they were, they were brokered there by President Trump. You see, the world is shaping up, ladies and gentlemen. And whether, it's, whether it be days or weeks or months or perhaps years, what we know for sure is that World War III is on the way. And just like the First and Second World Wars played a role in fulfilling Bible prophecy, so the future World War will be in complete fulfilment of these prophecies given thousands of years ago. Well, perhaps this leaves you concerned, frightened even. I mean, it certainly is a very gloomy picture. But thankfully it doesn't end there. And that's why we're here this evening. The events of Ezekiel 38 are followed by visions of a future kingdom that God is going to set up on the earth. We're told that he will send his son, Jesus Christ, to build a temple in Jerusalem, to reign over a world at peace. There will be a fair and just government. There will be food and safety for all. And just as certainly as the prophecies of Russia's invasion are shaping up before our eyes, so too... God is going to send his son to reign as king on the earth. And to give you just a taste of what that wonderful time will, in, will be like, I've selected just one Bible passage, and you'll no, no doubt recognise some of the language as it echoes Ezekiel 38. The prophet Isaiah writes of the kingdom to come, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Instead of all nations gathering for war as we saw here in Ezekiel 38, they will instead gather to this house of worship, this temple in Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and he shall rebuke many people. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. That is the wonderful future that God has painted for us and to which we are invited. So this evening I'd like to leave you with one final Bible passage. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks one more time about the world war which is to come, Armageddon. And in this the little section on Armageddon, he gives us one last warning. We read that there will come a time when the kings of the earth and of the whole world will be gathered together for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And you'll see that this is called Armageddon. They gather them together to a place called in Hebrew Armageddon. That's the only, the only use of this word in the Bible. So Jesus Christ again warns that there will be this great battle involving all nations at the end of time here on earth. But now look at what he says. I should say at the end of time as we know it, before he comes. But now look at what he says in between. He interjects and he says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. 
Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You see, Jesus is saying that Armageddon's coming. But more importantly, he says that he is coming. He's coming to set up that kingdom of which we read a moment ago. He says, I'm going to come suddenly. So suddenly that it will be as if a thief has broken into your house. So get ready. Be prepared for me to come back. Because once you see me, it'll be too late to prepare. Jesus Christ is coming, friends. In this book, the Bible, God has given us all that we need to know and all that we need to prepare. World events are screaming at us that we are headed for world war and that Jesus Christ is soon to return. So let's get ready. Let's prepare. Let's learn about Jesus Christ, who he was, what he asks us to do, so that when he returns and conquers the Russian army, he finds us ready and waiting for him.